All right. Good evening, guys. It is Sunday night, and that means it's Sunday night at 7 o'clock, and that means it's Sunday night service with Danny and Dr. Motley, who is, of course, not here again tonight. I think it's three or four weeks in a row he's not here, but we he'll be back next week, and we will be discussing gratitude next week, the power of gratitude and healing. So I'm really excited about that. And um, tonight we're talking Alzheimer's disease, all right? Alzheimer's and dementia and is absolutely an epidemic. And it is a very, it is a, a disease that is very close to my heart. Hello, Bonnie. As you guys get logged on, hit your heart buttons and we're going to get talking. But as you're logging on, hi, Wendy and Charlie. Tomorrow, starting tomorrow, 7 a.m. at Integrative Family Medicine, you can drop off your supplies to help Panama City Beach. My college roommate, my best friend in college, my little sister in my sorority, lives full-time on the beach in Panama City, and she has now got power and water back, but she spent her 50th birthday today at her employer, which is Train Air Conditioning, handing out food and water and meals and all that because people and people in their plant have lost everything, but there are hundreds of thousands down there that are affected and we're going to be a drop off. And Billy has somebody running supplies from Franklin, from Nashville down to Panama city every single week until Thanksgiving. So you can drop off. The list is on Danny Williamson wellness under events. So you can see everything that they need and you can't give too much. There's not too much water. There's not too much bug spray. There's not too much of anything that you can give. You're welcome to drop it off at my office. Started at seven o'clock tomorrow and we are going to pile it up. And I am excited. We're going to show Panama City some love, some Tennessee volunteer state love. All right, guys, while you guys are logged on, oh, it looks like we have a ton of people on here tonight. So we're talking, hello, Dorinda. It's good to see you, sis and Denise. We're talking Alzheimer's and Alzheimer's disease has touched my family very closely. My grandmother died of dementia. I do believe it was Alzheimer's. My mom swears up and down it's not Alzheimer's, but she didn't know us at all by the end. My mom at 72 was diagnosed with dementia. She's now 74 and it's been a, a struggle. And we're going to talk about it tonight. We're going to talk about the statistics. We're going to start with the statistics and then I hope you have a pen and paper because we're going to go over the supplements and we're going to go over books to read and all kinds of things. Because listen, friends, Alzheimer's disease is a disease of prevention. If you don't prevent it, it is a slow moving train once you're diagnosed and it actually starts many times in our 40s or early 40s. My actual next door neighbor here was in her 40s when she was diagnosed with Alzheimer's and she's now, I think she's 55 and she's on hospice and she's in a nursing home and it's just so sad and she has three daughters and I moved here five years ago and she was diagnosed probably the summer or so before that. It's a dreadful disease. So Alzheimer's disease is the most common form of dementia, right, among the elderly. It currently affects in the United States approximately 5.1 million Americans. It is predicted, and that number is predicted to triple by 2050. It's clinically manifested as a progressive loss of memory and cognitive function, right? That's what Alzheimer's disease is. Usually that's it, and it's got a formation of amyloid plaques and tangles in the brain, which we're not going to really get into all of that tonight. We're just going to discuss really the ways you prevent it and things we can do once you're diagnosed. Since its discovery in 1906, extensive research has been undertaken to define all the Alzheimer's pathogenesis and the root cause of it and the reason for it. But we have not found one single reason for Alzheimer's disease. It is the leading cause of death that is on the rise in the United States that does not have a cure, okay? It's a terminal illness. It is a terminal illness. Once you're diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease, you will die with Alzheimer's disease. Now, they say that the person, we've got someone born right now in the United States who who, you know, we'll see a cure for Alzheimer's disease already. So I'm hoping so. Starts in our 40s. 
every 66 seconds someone is diagnosed with dementia in the United States. By the year 2050, every 33 seconds, someone will be diagnosed. Every 33 seconds. So I don't know, we're gonna be on here 45 minutes or an hour tonight. Every 33 seconds by the year 2050, someone will be diagnosed. There's approximately 500,000 new cases of Alzheimer's disease diagnosed this year, 500,000. One in nine Americans age 65 and older have Alzheimer's disease. More than 5 million Americans have Alzheimer's, right? By 2050, we know that there's going to be over 14 million people age 65 and over. It's the sixth leading cause of death in the United States. Many people say it's the third leading cause, right? It kills more people yearly than prostate and breast cancer combined. Just know that. From the year 2000 to 2013, Alzheimer's disease death increased by 71%. Worldwide, 46.8 million people are believed to have Alzheimer's disease or other dementias. By 2030, which is very soon, by the way, this, what is that, 12 years? By 2030, we will increase that worldwide to 74.7 million people will have dementia. By 2050, it's estimated 160 million people will be diagnosed. Every 3.2 seconds right now in the world, someone is diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. Every 3.2 seconds. So you're seeing the, um, the massive, the, the huge undertaking that this is, right? This is huge. Females, females have a greater lifetime risk of developing Alzheimer's disease, and they constitute two thirds of the current Alzheimer's disease population. We have a greater lifetime risk and we are two thirds of the population. And who are the caregivers? Who are the caregivers in the United States and worldwide? It's females, it's females. The, the mechanisms underlying the gender bias in Alzheimer's remain poorly understood. And what that means is we really don't know why women have a higher rate of Alzheimer's disease. And again, prevention is key, right? Dr. Bredesen, who wrote this book right here. Yes, Tiffany, those stats are terrible. And there's way more, but we're not going to go through all these. This book right here, The End of Alzheimer's, rocked my world in 2017 when it came out. It is hands down the best book that I've ever read. It's very controversial because when you say you can help turn something around, again, um, those things are always controversial. Write this book down, take a picture of the screen here, screenshot it, do whatever you need to do. But this book right here has been a game changer for me. Okay. Whoops, I just dropped my water in the floor here. Uh, the leading test for Alzheimer's disease, excuse me, I got to pick up my Fiji water. By the way, Fiji is one of the, the waters that has silica in it. And if you're going to drink bottled water, you want to drink Fiji water because silica helps with pulling mercury out of the brain. And so Fiji water has more silica in it than any other water on the market. Okay, so we're going to talk about right here about how you, the testing for Alzheimer's disease, right? APOE. Now I put a poll up here actually, um, and it says this is a brand new feature on Facebook Live. Would you want to know your APOE status? Okay, so this is a gene status. APOE is what tells you your, um, it's part of your risk factors, right, for Alzheimer's disease. APOE4 is the, the major risk factor genetically, okay? Patients with two copies of APOE4 rarely make it to 100 years right? They're rare, they rarely see their uh, 100 years of age. 75 million Americans, just Americans, 75 million carry the APOE4 gene. Would you want to know if you carried that gene or not? Answer the question. There's a poll on there. Just answer yes, no, or unsure. I put so I was very torn about this and part of me wanted to know because of my family history, 
part of me didn't want to know. Jackson didn't want me to find out. Ella didn't care. She was like, yeah, if you want to know, no, mom, she's real good like that. So this is interesting. AP, I, I had my testing done. I used a maximized or max, max gen, formerly maximized genetics. I had my genetics testing done. I did the entire panel, which is $299, and that's way cheaper than just checking APOE. I checked a lot of genetics, which you all can see we've done a genetic um, Sunday night service. So my genetic results for Alzheimer's disease. I am an APOE 2-3. I have a very, I have a, a quite decreased chance of getting Alzheimer's disease. APOE2 is neuroprotective, they believe. APOE3 is what the majority of the, of the world has is a three. So I'm a two, three. I do not have the four in there. That's good. Both, I, I would put money on the fact that my mom and my grandmother had have fours, but of course my grandmother can't be tested. And my mom probably wouldn't. So I am an APOE two, three. Here's what we know about APO testing, APOE testing, APOE three. So if you already know what your results are, here's some interesting information. APOE3 is present in approximately 75% of the population and is believed to play a neutral role, role, right? It doesn't increase your chances. It doesn't decrease your chances. It's just neutral right there. APOE2, which is what I have, is relatively rare with only a 5% incidence of the population, of course. <laughs> I never have anything that everybody has. And it's considered to be pro a protective a neuroprotected variant to the gene, to Alzheimer's disease, I'm sorry. By contrast, the most potent genetic risk factor for Alzheimer's, APOE4, exists in only about 20% of the population. Now listen to this, APOE4 is only in about 20% of the population. However, it is present in nearly 50% of all Alzheimer's patients. It is estimated that individuals who carry two APOE alleles and one APOE2 allele, oh, and one two and one three allele, which is what I have, are 40% less likely to develop Alzheimer's disease than those who carry two of the threes. Okay, people who have one AEOP, APOE4 and one three, are 3.2 to 14.9 more times more likely to have to develop Alzheimer's disease. It's fascinating research and everybody in my office was tested and I have, I have one of the best genetic mutations. Now, this does not guarantee that I won't have Alzheimer's disease, right? By the time I'm 55, it, it doesn't guarantee it, but my chances are less likely. All right, so you can have that test done. You can have the full panel. I don't, they don't just check APOE, but they do all the, the weight loss, the detox panel, the genetics panel. It's a combo panel. It's $299, which is a better price than Quest Diagnostics, which is $485 just for APOE4. So I'd rather go ahead and have all that other stuff done. Okay, so. There's a website, for those of you who already know what your status is, there's a website called apoe4.info, and it is absolutely fantastic, that website is, aepoe4.info, -E -E and it's an excellent website on APOE, okay? All right, so, that being said, go ahead and answer your, your poll there. Do you want, would you want to be tested? Would you not want to be tested? Amen about genes, only one part of it. You, you jumped ahead here on what I was gonna say, but I'll repeat it multiple times. Your genetics is the gun, right? Your environment pulls the trigger. And we know that on every single condition, Brooke, your environment, pulls the trigger, right? And that's what Dr. Bredesen says in his book, right? Inflammation, 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 number one. He also says suboptimal uh, levels of your, your basic nutrients, number two. 
Number three, environmental toxins, heavy metals, aluminum, things like that, exposures. Those are key contributors, the top three contributors he believes to Alzheimer's. Nutrition, suboptimal levels of your nutrients, and then your toxic exposures, right? Diet, sleep, exercise. What do I tell you all? We have to eat well, sleep well, move well, poop well, decrease stress, and have community. Those things are key, all right? Inflammation, number one. We have got to decrease inflammation in the body. Do you know that the average American eats 150 to 160 pounds of white sugar a year? That equals about a half a pound a day, half a pound of sugar a day. I don't doubt it. I don't doubt it. Cocoa flavanols appear to work by improving your insulin sensitivity. Many of you know Alzheimer's disease has already been called type three, type three diabetes, an insulin problem, a blood sugar problem, right? There was one study, they studied, they studied 520 milligrams per day of cocoa flavanols, and that's about 800 to 560 grams a day of dark chocolate. All right, so cocoa flavanols, something you can do to help as well decrease inflammation, improve insulin sensitivity. Ch tart cherry juice, 200 milliliters a day for 12 weeks in this one study, improved cognition with dementia patients, just a little bit, okay? So here we're getting ready to talk about environmental factors. We're gonna start with environmental factors. Alzheimer's disease is most prevalent in industrialized countries, right? As much as four times higher in industrialized countries in certain parts of the world. Perhaps, and it's hypothesized that perhaps environmental pollution plays a role in the pathogens, right? Many Alzheimer's patients have, have decreased ability to metabolize and get rid of toxins and to detox, particularly things like sulfur. So you've got environmental exposure plus a decreased ability to metabolize toxins, and that many times equals Alzheimer's disease or dementia. Aluminum. There's been multiple, multiple studies on aluminum that have shown that aluminum exposure can contribute, it can be a contributing factor to Alzheimer's disease. A high dietary intake of aluminum or increased aluminum in your drinking water has been shown to increase the risk of Alzheimer's disease in some studies, but this is controversial, so this is clearly not the end all be all. What are some foods that have a lot of aluminum in them? Alum, right? Pickles, processed cheeses, deodorants, yeah, cooking utensils, Foods that contain sodium aluminum phosphate. Taco Bell's soft shell tacos have sodium aluminum phosphate in them. Kentucky Fried Chicken biscuits have sodium aluminum phosphate. McDonald's, the salt on the burgers has sodium aluminum phosphate in it. And the list goes on and on. Now, I don't know about you all, but I haven't eaten at Kentucky Fried Chicken, Taco Bell, or McDonald's in years, so I don't, I don't know about that. But I didn't know about the deodorant until not too many years ago, taking the aluminum out of the deodorant, so I use an all-natural deodorant now. A diet, your diet, right? Okay, so I mentioned, in case you all forgot, or not forgot, but didn't um, log on, or are you just now joining? Fiji water has more silica in it than any other bottled water. And if you're gonna drink bottled water, silica helps to remove aluminum from the brain. Of course, we would be talking about detoxing, detoxing, detoxing a couple of times a year, things to gently remove toxins from the body and the liver. A Mediterranean diet has been studied and been associated with a decreased risk of Alzheimer's disease. Now, all of you know that I am a huge fan of a Mediterranean diet. I mean, I've got so many cookbooks back here on the Mediterranean diet. That Mediterranean paleo cookbook right there is one of my favorites. I love a Mediterranean diet. It's the way the majority of the world eats, right? 
lean fish, nuts, seeds, fruits, vegetables, good oils, good olive oils, avocado oils, a little bit of red wine. They're eating, they're eating grains in a Mediterranean diet, but you know, very little, very limited grains, all of the fish and the vegetables and the uh, nuts and seeds and tiny bit of fruit, not a ton of fruit that you can eat. Mediterranean diet, Mediterranean diet, Mediterranean diet, juicing. Now this is really interesting. I found this interesting. There was a study that showed that those who drank fruit or vegetable juice at least three times a week had a 76% lower incidence of Alzheimer's disease than those who drank juices less than one time a week. Now that was from the American Journal of Medicine in 2006. So three green juices, this one, is excellent. This one is called the Green Goddess, and it is kale, lime, spinach, cucumber. I can't remember what all's in it. It's all green. There is nothing other than green in here. You have to be real careful with juices. You drink a fruit juice, it is loaded with sugar. And we know that um, Alzheimer's disease is called type 3 diabetes. So you want to be real careful with your sugar intake, even if it's natural sugar. But a green juice three times a week. Now I got this one at Whole Foods and I can't afford to do that. I mean, good Lord, this is $6. So that, although when you think about it, $18 a week, if you didn't go out and eat one meal, maybe, I, I don't know, if you, if you um, juice at home, it's still very expensive if you use organic juice, right? I mean, organic vegetables and fruits, it's very expensive. But three times a week of a green juice, Heck yeah, if it'll reduce, if it could help reduce my risk by 76%, good Lord, yes. Okay, now it's where we get into all the good stuff, right? There's some of the statistics, but we're going to talk about the nutritional supplements. And again, you cannot supplement yourself to good health, people. There's not enough of these supplements in the world to fix a bad diet. And you can't see, but I've got a truckload of supplements over here in front of me. These are all coming out of Dr. Dale Bredesen's book, The End of Alzheimer's, as well as Dr. Alan Gaby. I love Dr. Gaby, and he, he, he doesn't have a book for you all to read. He has a textbook for us, a nutritional medicine textbook, but he is strictly by the book clinical studies. So what I'm getting ready to go over here are some things that have had clinical studies behind them. Could be some weak studies, but they're things that won't hurt you or your loved one, but could help you. Okay, acetyl L-carnitine. This is the first one that I've got listed, right? Acetyl L-carnitine may help decrease the decline of brain mitochondrial function that happens with age. The dosing, two to three grams, slow down deterioration of mental function in those with Alzheimer's disease. In a, there was a clinical, or there have been several clinical studies. Acetyl L-carnitine, two to three grams a day. B12, just straight up B12. I use this one. This one's, we private label this one. This one's five grams, five milligrams of um, methyl B12. Low B12 levels, levels was found in 23 to 30% of patients with Alzheimer's disease mm -hmm. or probable Alzheimer's disease in several studies. Hydroxycobalamin was given a thousand micrograms a shot in intramuscular IM two to three times weekly for four weeks. If improvement continued, if improvement continue as needed. So we usually don't do hydroxy uh, B12 shots. These are, these are methylcobalamin and then our shots in the office are a combination of hydroxy and methylcobalamin. But B12 levels, 5,000. Now my mom will take this, it's five milligrams a day. My mom will take this. This is sublingual. I'm a big fan of B12 just for energy. But when you have low B12 levels, you may have numbness and tingling in the hands and feet, neuropsychiatric symptoms, memory loss, things like that, dementia. I put a lot of people on B12. I check a lot of B12 and it's low. Magnesium. Oh my goodness. Magnesium right here. OptiMag Neuro. Well, I'm sorry. Magnesium 3 and 8 has been studied. Um, it's the one magnesium, and again, all of these things, nothing has died in the wool here. Magnesium 3 and 8 is the one magnesium that they say 
crosses the blood-brain barrier. So we have all different forms of magnesium, glycinate, chelate, oxide, citrate, all those, but magnesium threonate is the one that studies have shown crosses the blood-brain barrier. And again, some people are, eh, I don't know about that, but there was a study that showed that threonate decreased memory loss in mild to moderate dementia, not severe or Alzheimer's decreased brain loss by nine years, okay? So decreased brain, yeah, improve their memory by nine years. I think that would be the best way to say it. I use OptiMag Neuro. I personally use two in the office. I use Mag3 and from Metagenics, which is a pill. Many people don't like a powder. This is a powder and you mix it and you drink it at dinner time and you drink it at, when you go to bed. It tastes amazing. And it's kind of like, I've got some patients who tell me, some older patients and they're like, yeah, we make it our little cocktail. We drink two little cocktails, one at dinner, one at bedtime and I love it. I love this. I love the way it takes. I take it every day. I take one of the three and eights every day and I kind of alternate in between the pills. This is two capsules. This is one scoop. Magnesium three and eight. And that is spelled T H R. E-O-N-A-T-E, three and eight, and it works beautifully. Yes, low stomach acid will inhibit B12 absorption. It certainly will. But if you do it sublingual, Brooke, it's not going to inhibit stomach absorption because it's not going to go through the stomach. It goes immediately through uh, the salivary gland. So, but yes, B12, you have to be careful with, and we're not going to be talking about stomach acid tonight, but yes, stomach acid is a big, big deal if it's low. So we're talking acetyl L-carnitine, B12, magnesium threonate, inositol. There's been some clinical studies on inositol, and I love inositol. For those of you that know, I deal with a lot of um, uh, uh, good Lord, um, anxiety in the office and, I, and polycystic ovarian syndrome, and I use a ton of inositol. And what it does, inositol is involved in the neurotransmitter signaling signaling in the brain, right? And the way the neurotransmitters bounce off of each other and the way they work and they send signals to each other. So inositol, what they studied was six grams a day. Six grams a day, which is one scoop of this, I think. Um, actually, it would be one and a half scoops of this is what was studied. And this is a powder. You drink it, you mix it up. It works amazing for anxiety as well, as well as helping with insulin resistance in PCOS. I like inositol. Six grams a day in divided doses showed some improvement in memory loss. CoQ10, iron, and B6 in certain patients, not everybody, with a genetic mutation of the amyloid beta protein uh, precursor gene, those things seem to help. CoQ10, I think it was 100 milligrams a day, a little bit of iron and a little bit of B6. But I don't have a lot of research on that, so we're not going to talk about that one. Vitamin E. Vitamin E is a very inexpensive, I mean, $27 for two months worth, very inexpensive um, antioxidant, right? So it's, a, it's an antioxidant, which helps mop up free radicals in the brain, which helps with um, oxidative, I mean, it's, it mops up oxidative stress, which is, you know, a path to Alzheimer's disease. Increasing vitamin E in the diet is associated with the decreased risk of Alzheimer's disease. And they used a thousand international units twice a day of mixed tocopherol. So you want to make sure that it's mixed, right? It's got your delta, your alpha, and your beta, and your gamma tocopherols in here. Always look at your vitamin E and make sure. For two years, using a thousand milligram, or I'm sorry, a thousand international units twice a day, for two years appeared to, appeared to slow the progression of dementia. Studies are ongoing to see if the doses less than 2,000 will be beneficial, right? Because normally I just tell patients to take 800, 400 to 800 international units a day. Okay, zinc, omega-3, omega-3, not definitive, not definitive, and the research is the research is not definitive on that. But I personally think that good, high quality fish oil will not hurt you. And I use at least 2.5 grams a day. I use a Metagenics brand. There are great fish oils out there on the market. 
Nordic Naturals, Carlson Labs are two that I love. I like this one. I've used it for probably about six years, this exact one, EPA DHA 720, because you don't burp it up at all. But the studies are controversial on this. They're not definitive that they're going to decrease memory loss. But what fish oil does is helps decrease inflammation in the body and inflammation in the brain. And so, in theory, one would think that it would help. And then silicon, right? Silicon inhibits the absorption of aluminum. What they studied was if you took silica, up to one liter a day of silicon-rich water, your mean, your urinary excretion of aluminum increased. So up to one liter a day. And actually they studied Fiji water is what was studied. What are some foods that are high in silica? Well, things we don't, or I don't eat, wheat bran, rice bran, oat bran, whole grains, bananas, and soy. So out of every single one of those, I don't eat rice. Well, I eat a little bit of rice, but not much. Wheat, not many oats. <laughs> soy, I don't. Whole grains, yeah. Bananas. Bananas the only one, and I have a food sensitivity to bananas, so there you go. I'll have to stick with my Fiji water, okay? Phosphatidyl serine. So have any of you ever used phosphatidyl serine? I use PS150, I'm sorry, PS50 phosphatidyl serine. We use it with patients with memory loss. I use it at night because it helps lower nighttime cortisol levels in my adrenal dysfunction patients. So patients who are wired but tired but can't go to sleep, I, I start them on phosphatidyl serine with, and I tell them, you know, some studies show that it helps with, with memory loss at all. But what they say is, you know, it plays a role in the cell-to-cell -cell communication and the neurotransmitter communication, right? How it's pinging off of each other. And in Alzheimer's disease, those neurotransmitters don't, don't function properly. There's been some studies in Europe with bovine brains, so cow brains, right, that showed some improvement with phosphatidyl serine, but decreased improvement after six months. So it's a little nah, iffy. We don't have a whole lot uh, to go off of. In the United States, phosphatidyl serine is derived from soy and not proven to um, decrease your risk or Alzheimer's disease at all. Okay. All right. Choline. Choline, choline, choline has been shown to, you know, have a modest effect on patients with early versus more progressive Alzheimer's disease. No dosing, though, has been suggested, so don't ask me because they don't have a dose out there yet. Again, prevention is key. So what food has the most choline in it? Eggs. Eggs have a ton of choline. I don't know if they have the most choline, but they have a lot of choline in it. If you're not sensitive to eggs and you can eat good, grass-fed, free-range eggs, then eat eggs and get, get your choline that way. Ginkgo biloba. All right, this I have been taken for now. I'm on my second bottle of this, and there's 100 capsules in each bottle. So I'm um, into my fourth month of this right now. Most, but not all, double-blinded trials have found that ginkgo is more effective than a placebo in patients with Alzheimer's disease. This is a very, very cheap $20, I think. Yeah, $20 for 100 pills. I like this ginkgo, it is good. It also has a little bit of Eleutherococcus in it. And anybody who knows about Eleuthero, Eleuthero is an adrenal adaptogen. It helps with people who are under chronic long-term stress. It helps to bring up your, your cortisol levels if you need it or bring it down if you don't need it too. So this one is, this one's my favorite. The price is right and it's a clean, good ginkgo. The side effect of this, the unexpected side effect was for me is it has, excuse me, decreased my hot flashes drastically. I mean, absolutely drastically decreased my hot flashes. So I take, this is 120 milligrams for one capsule and I'm only taking it once a day. Yeah, once a day. So what they studied for ginkgo was 120 to 240 milligrams a day. So I could take it twice a day. I'm only taking it once a day. My hot flashes have gone down. I don't know if my memory is any better. I, I don't think my memory is bad, but I was just telling a doctor today, I was meeting with an emergency room doctor at the office this afternoon and she wants to get into functional medicine. I'm so excited. She reached out to me, so I was helping her. And I told her, I said, you know, I don't know if it's helped with my memory or not. It's not hurting me. And so I'm gonna take it. 
this, you know, ginkgo comes from the oldest tree known to man, over 2 million years old, the ginkgo tree. And the leaves of the ginkgo tree look like a brain. It's fascinating if you look up ginkgo leaves um, and they've got all these great um, veins in them that look like arteries too. It's fascinating. So ginkgo biloba, $20. Good gosh. Why wouldn't you do that for, for 100 capsules? Helps with your hot flashes, helps with your memory, helps with heart health as well. Ginkgo does. Okay, we're going through a ton of these. DHEA. Now, I find this interesting. I can't take DHEA. It makes me mean, mean as a hornet. But DHEA, you know, is made in your adrenal glands, and it converts over to testosterone in your body, right? But it contributed to memory, to decreasing your memory. It helps your memory when they studied it in mice, okay? Some blood studies have shown that DHEA levels are low in patients with Alzheimer's disease. And we check the, I check DHEA on most every patient. Um, my level, I remember when I had it checked was 87, which is pretty low normal, but I took it and I got so irritated. I'm testing a different one right now, a seven keto DHEA to see if that process is differently. But five milligrams a day of DHEA is what, five to 15 milligrams, 10 to 20 for men. Most women I put on five to 10, you know, it's $18. There's four months worth in here. Why not? It's not going to, well, I'm, I can't say it's not going to hurt you. It won't hurt you, but it could make you irritable. Could give you a little bit of acne. DHEA, easy, inexpensive way. It also helps with exercise recovery, right? It, if it converts to testosterone, then of course it helps you feel better. It helps with muscle mass and sex drive. Melatonin. So, how many of you all take melatonin? I like melatonin. I don't have to take it because actually I've been sleeping much better the last several months. So I don't have to take melatonin. If my dog didn't snore every night, I would sleep really good. But melatonin has been shown to be low in Alzheimer's patients. Okay. There was a double blinded trial that showed that two milligrams of melatonin for 24 weeks increased cognitive performance and sleep efficacy significantly in patients with mild to moderate Alzheimer's disease and increased benefits with those who had insomnia. So they actually weren't giving it to, to patients just for insomnia. They were just seeing, you know, if it improved their memory and it did. You know, when you can sleep, your body heals when you sleep. I'm a big believer in that. And so part of dementia and Alzheimer's is they don't sleep well at night. They're up constantly. And um, I love, yeah, um, Denise, I use Zymogen's brand because it's $20 for three months worth. So I really do try to find things that are well-priced and I love Zymogen products. I love their products and they do a really great job and they're clean and they just, they have a really good uh, quality control program. So I use theirs. Theirs is actually, this one is five milligrams of melatonin. Let's see here, this is the sample. This is a tablet. So if you had a pill cutter, you could cut it and have 2.5, or you could even just nibble off of it and, you know, however much, one or two milligrams. But I do like melatonin. I don't have a problem with people taking melatonin. I know Dr. Lodog, Taroni Lodog, who is one of my all-time favorite medical doctors. She practices functional medicine. Um, she takes it every night. She and her husband take it every night. I've seen her speak multiple times. And she said, you know, you're not going to mess up your, your circadian rhythm at all. Our circadian rhythm naturally is designed to go up with, the, or we're supposed to wake up with the sun and go down with the sun. And look what we've done through, through the lights up here, you know, the cell phones, the computers, the uh, wireless routers, everything. We have destroyed our circadian rhythm. So she takes it. Sometimes you can give yourself a little wash out and come off of it for a few weeks or so and then go back on it. It's, it's fine. I don't think it's going to hurt you. Now, this is one of my favorites. And I took this for a long time and I kind of, does anybody, is anybody like me, they'll take things and then they fall off of it or they run out of it and they forget to get it again. And good Lord, I work in a supplement store. So um, I don't know why. Lithium, low dose lithium. Now I'm telling you, I love low dose lithium. So this is pretty fascinating. If you look up lithium in general, the towns and the cities that have lithium in their water supply have less murders, 
less homicides, less suicides, less violence in their cities. I think it was, it's probably been two or three years now, I can't remember, two or three years ago, New York City, was it New York City? I think it was New York City, it's not Chicago. Chicago needs some lithium in their, in their water supply. Um, I think New York City started putting lithium in their water supply. So lithium is neuro, it's shown to have neuroprotective, neuro brain, right? Neuroprotective effects uh, have been demonstrated on, on the brain with using low dose lithium. There's been some randomized trials that showed improvements in patients with Alzheimer's disease at a very low dose of lithium, 300 micrograms a day for 15 months. The lithium group showed no change in their decline. So they didn't check, they didn't decline after 15 months. They stayed the same, right? The control group showed a progressive decline, right? The ones who did not get any lithium whatsoever. I personally use 10 milligrams twice a day. No, five milligrams twice a day. What am I saying? Well, that's what I used to use. I don't, I'm not using it right now, but lithium orotate, uh, my supervising physician is a psychiatrist and he taught me about lithium years ago for patients just to help them feel better. And again, like things like seven up, I mean, you can read all about lithium. Lithium's pretty incredible. Seven up used to have lithium in it. Um, the town where my aunt and uncle and my cousins all are in, in, in Georgia, Lithia Springs, that's lithium. It was lithium springs. They had lithium in their water. So lithium, lithium works. 10 milligrams, five milligrams twice a day is what I recommend with patients. Selenium, 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 selenium. I mean, selenium is such a great mineral, right? And we are so deficient in selenium as a rule. Selenium, actually consumption of Brazil nuts. This was a randomized controlled trial that showed that was studying consumption of Brazil nuts, right? Showed significantly improved cognition function in, in the elderly with low serum levels of selenium. They had, it showed mild cognitive improvement, right? It, any improvement is better than none. And it's about 200 micrograms a day is what's been studied, which is one little capsule of selenium. Four Brazil nuts a day, if you have organic, Brazil nuts, four Brazil nuts a day equals approximately 200 micrograms of selenium. But you don't wanna eat more than that. You don't wanna take more than 200 because you can get selenium toxic. So, you know, two to three to four Brazil nuts a day may give you some selenium. Selenium also, what else does it work with? All of you all are on here um, that know this. Thyroid, Hashimoto's, it helps convert T4 to T3. No, I'm sorry, good Lord. It helps lower thyroid antibodies, Hashimoto's antibodies, but selenium is needed for good thyroid function as well. So I, I'm a big fan. Although if you take a good multivitamin, it most likely is gonna have 200 micrograms of selenium in it. B6, B12, and folate, vitamin B6, vitamin B12 and folate, folic acid. There's been multiple studies that have shown that supplementation with those three B vitamins help decrease cognitive decline. This will help well. So what's the, what's the pathophysiology behind that, right? I'm not quite sure, but B6, B12 and methylfolate help lower homocysteine levels. Homocysteine is a cardiac inflammation marker. It's a big marker of inflammation, right? So that lowers, those lower homocysteine levels, that's quite possibly the pathway that it works in. I lower homocysteine levels with this right here, methyl care. This is high dose methylfolate, B12, B6, but it also has riboflavin in it and zinc and manganese and uh, molybdenum and N-acetylcysteine and betaine hydrochloric uh, acid. Uh, who was it who said that about betaine hydrochloric acid? I can't remember. But anyway, Brooke, I think um, this right here lowers homocysteine level better than anything that I have found. Plus, it gives you energy. Patients tell me that this methyl care gives them a tremendous amount of energy. I don't take this. My homocysteine level is great. But I do use the neuro cream. And those of you that use the neuro cream, um, you should hit your heart buttons because I'm telling you, this is fantastic for memory 
for energy, for ADD, ADHD. I mean, it's, I love this. It's one pump twice a day. This is actually high dose, five milligrams of methyl folate, five mil milligrams of methyl B12, six milligrams of B6, and it has 1,200 international units in it of D3. It was originally formulated, and we private label it because we, we sell so much of this, but this was originally formulated for patients with an MTHFR mutation who have a detoxification pathway blockage, and they generally have low B vitamins. This is this right here is a game changer for energy. I have patients just keep it in their purse, put one pump on in the morning, one pump in the early afternoon when they start to get a little slump or before they go home for work or from work, and it works beautifully. So that's been shown to help decrease um, cognitive decline. Alpha lipoic acid. So I get a lot of people tell me that they they think that alpha lipoic acid helps with their memory. But small, it, there's just been some tiny studies, not some big randomized controlled trials on this, have shown some improvement, some improvement in cognitive decline. The main reason that it probably shows improvement in cognitive decline is, does anybody know what alpha lipoic acid does? It helps decrease insulin resistance and insulin levels. And again, type, or, um, Alzheimer's disease has been tagged type three diabetes. So anything that's gonna help with insulin resistance quite possibly could help with memory loss as well. It helped with mild dementia, not moderate, not severe dementia and Alzheimer's disease. 600 milligrams a day is what's been studied. 600 milligrams a day. I use the one from Zymogen. I actually don't use this, but I have my daughter. Yeah, Brooke, um, Alpha, um, Zymogen is the one that I use. And here's the reason that I use this in the office, because it's a controlled release, extended release alpha lipoic acid. Alpha lipoic acid is kind of like glutathione. It's very difficult to get into the cells. And so you have to take a tremendous amount of alpha lipoic acid for it to work, or you'd have to take it every few hours. This is dosed twice a day extended release 600 milligrams and it really does get in it's the controlled release that really helps it get into the cells i like this alpha lipoic acid book okay one of my favorites oh i hope i brought it yeah rhodiola rhodiola okay we all know that rhodiola is an adaptogen i teach on rhodiola all the stinking time for um adrenal for adrenal for um memory, right? Rhodiola has been studied for memory. It's been studied for cognitive decline. It's an, anti it's an antioxidant. It's also an anti-inflammatory, anti and it is neuroprotective as well as cardioprotective. So it protects the heart. Rhodiola is, is, I love ashwagandha, but I'm telling you, when I was really having some adrenal issues, rhodiola was my go-to. I, did, I can't take it at night because it keeps me up. It gives me too much energy. But, excuse me, rhodiola has been studied. And, uh, got, let's see, how much is it? How much is it? It is 120 milligrams twice a day. That's what I take. That's what I, I recommend. I mean, this comes from Gaia. They use organic herbs. There's lots of great herbs out there that are organic. I like, I like Gaia because their prices are good. I mean, this is only $28. And it helps with, I think it was rhodiola. They did some studies with medical school students testing prior to testing and how their uh, memory was and rhodiola helped increase their memory. Okay, we've just got a couple of more here that have been studied. Turmeric, turmeric, turmeric. Anti-inflammatory, anti-inflammatory, anti-inflammatory. If you're not using turmeric in your food, excuse me, I just dropped my notes. If you're not using turmeric in your food and like grating it off into your food, then you need a really good supplement, right? I use Gaia's um, curcuma NFKB because it's high, high dose. Turmeric works with depression. It works with cognitive protection, right? It's also an anti-inflammatory. So they, they, that's the way that this works, helping with decreasing memory loss. In flavonoid intensive care from Metagenics is probably my all-time favorite because it has boswellia and it has frankincense in it. It has um, ginger in it. It has uh, xanthal humol. All of these are anti-inflammatory. I'm a big fan of, of turmeric. Whichever one you use, just get a good one 
because turmeric, again, like glutathione and alpha lipoic acid is very difficult for cuminous to get into the cells. So you'll need one that has a black pepper possibly in it. And it's a, that's an organic good curcumin. All right. I've had a lot of questions about CBD oil and cognitive um, memory and, and decline. Um, there's no definitive studies that I'm aware of on CBD oil with um, Alzheimer's disease and dementia. Now, CBD, a good, high quality, full spectrum, CO2 critically extracted, organic, third-party tested CBD, right, will decrease inflammation in your body. I don't know that it's going to improve your memory. It won't hurt you. It could help you. Um, what it does help with, I believe, is the behaviors associated with dementia and Alzheimer's, right? Patients with Alzheimer's disease, with dementia, many times they get anxious. They have insomnia. They have panic attacks and heart palpitations. I do believe that CBD helps. Now, I know that we will see more studies on this. We will see studies on CBD and neurocognitive decline because you're seeing studies on every condition and CBD right now. But I don't think that it would hurt the patient. I'm, I just don't know for sure that it would help, but I do know that CBD helps with anxiety and it helps with insomnia. And we just got on Friday and many of you saw our videos and stuff. We went to Earth's Glory in Kentucky, the, the CBD farm that we use, and we just got, we're the first office to get a thousand milligram. And I am so excited about this. Now it retails for $119. It is not cheap, but I'm going to tell you, and we'll, we'll talk all about that later. But I mean, the processing, um, the way they process this and, and, and it's the real deal. I've never seen a better, and trust me, I've studied a lot of CBD to try to figure out what I wanted to do with patients. And I am thrilled with that. So those are the supplements that we know possibly could have some benefit for dementia and Alzheimer's disease. Again, there is no cure. It is a disease of prevention. It starts in our forties many times. So these are things that will slow down these are things that will help prevent, combined with a good diet, sleep, exercise, decreasing stress, all of those things. Pharmaceutical wise, we're just gonna breeze by that because I don't write these pharmaceuticals. I don't write prescriptions for Aricept and Namenda, right? Aricept, you, you know. So we have these two pharmaceuticals that were designed and they were gonna, boy, they were gonna stop Alzheimer's disease. They didn't, right? They did not stop Alzheimer's disease. They may slow it down. They may not. I don't think that we really know. Um, they were the golden ticket. They were written as the golden ticket and they are not the golden ticket. We know that by the fact that every 66 seconds, someone in the United States is diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. They are not the golden ticket. When Aricept and Namenda were developed, they were developed and we still, they still, I think pharmaceutical companies still believe this, that it's a single disease, Alzheimer's is. Alzheimer's disease is not a single disease. Dr. Bredesen and his team have identified at least 36 holes in the roof is what he calls it. 36 holes in the roof that contribute to Alzheimer's disease, right? Things like we talked about inflammation, poor diet, nutrient deficiencies, heavy metals, Lyme disease, all the things, 36 holes in the roof they've, they've identified. It's not a single, a single um, diagnose, a single disease. No, Brooke, it hasn't helped my mom either. She's on Aricept and um, it hasn't helped her at all, actually. So, you know, in theory, Aricept is going to block, um, you know, your, your cholinesterase, right? Uh, what cholinesterase does is it destroys acetylcholine um, in your body. And is that correct? Does, does cholinesterase block acetylcholine? Good Lord, or stop. I, I'm having a brain um, fart over here. Cholinesterase keeps the enzyme, cholinesterase, I'm sorry, Aricept is a cholinesterase inhibitor. There we go. See, I don't use this. So it keeps the enzyme cholinesterase from destroying the neurotransmitter acetylcholine. That's what it does. So maybe it does help slow that down, slow that blockage down, but it doesn't stop it for darn sure. Now, Namenda 
generally we we prescribe that later on in the disease as long as it, as it's progressing many times they'll take the two together and what it does it inhibits the transmission of the brain signals from one neuron to the next via the neurotransmitter glutamate okay so and you have too much glutamate and then you've got all kinds of problems so namenda and aricept they they are on the market but they are not um they are not the golden ticket as they were thought so what are you going to do okay we know about prevention we know about the supplements there are certain lab tests that dr bredesen recommends right have um your c-reactive protein checked right c-reactive proteins is made in the liver and it's made and it goes up in response to things like infections and inflammation and you know inflammation c-reactive protein homocysteine levels another inflammatory marker right interleukin-6 that increases with inflammation uh, tumor necrosis factor that's a protein and the protein that's going to rise with inflammation as well every one of these are going to rise with inflammation a fasting insulin level a hemoglobin a1c a b12 level magnesium level d3 level Remember 30 to 100 is normal, but probably 50, 60, 70 is gonna be optimal. Have your thyroid panel checked, a full thyroid panel. Your sex hormones, oh my goodness, estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, DHEA, pregnenolone. These are all so important for brain health, not to mention your skin and your bone, bone health, you know, but estrogen estrogen itself has over 400 functions in your body and so when we go through menopause like me i'm almost a year through menopause well we're just not I, I, the estrogen level's gone hot flashes all these bones starting to break memory going now it's really quite interesting because i've got two patients both in their 80s they've been on hormones for 30 years which is not recommended at all by the way but they've been on bioidentical hormones for over 30 years. They are sharp as tax and their hormone levels are optimal. I check them every six months. They pay me cash every six months to check their hormones. Their estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, pregnenolone, and DHEA are all optimal. Those have got to be checked and they need to be optimal. And then we need to check your adrenals, right? Your adrenals are stress hormone, or, or produces stress hormones, cortisol, epinephrine, norepinephrine. They sit on top of your kidneys and they shoot out cortisol when you're under any stress at all. These are all things that need to be checked, right? In conjunction with a good diet, getting plenty of sleep at night. If you snore at night, you need to have a sleep study, right? Because quite possibly you have sleep apnea. Do you know that sleep apnea takes on average 10 to 16 years off of your lifespan? Sleep apnea, get a sleep study, get a CPAP machine, okay? It could save your life. Dr. Daniel Amen, who wrote The Brain Warrior's Way, he says, you've got to move your body. You've got to walk like you're late 45 minutes, four days a week, minimum. 45 minutes, four days a week, walk like you're late. You've got to exercise. You have to decrease the stress in your life. Stress will kill you. Hands down, it will kill you. So decrease the stress in your life. Stop smoking. Get in an infrared sauna. Studies have shown that patients who get in an infrared sauna two to seven times a week have a decreased risk of Alzheimer's disease. Drink a green juice at least three times a week get in a far infrared sauna get your toxins your heavy metals your lyme disease your, your epstein bar all those things out of you sweating in a far infrared sauna okay learn a new language i barely speak english i have i need to learn a new language learn how to play the guitar right or some instrument go back to school yes take a class Play board games, games, you know, Sudoku, Sudoku. I've never played that. What is it? Sudoku, Sudoku. Yeah, all of that. Surround yourself with community. You have got to have community. You have to laugh. You have to get your feet on the earth. You have to earth. These are all things that I'm saying. There's no research on this that I'm aware of. But neurofeedback. So I don't know if KK Ray is watching tonight. Hey, Joe, how are you? KK Ray is brilliant she does qeeg neurofeedback so if you don't know what neurofeedback is they put all these trans uh transducers electrodes on your head um kk if you're watching 
um, chime in here. She sent me some research this afternoon. She texted me some stuff on that there's been some small studies that neurofeedback improves the rate of decline and memory function in dementia and Alzheimer's patients. Boy, it reworks and rewires those neurotransmitters in your brain. I don't have, a, I have, I can't say enough good things about neurofeedback. And she's over at, I can put her phone number up if you guys are interested. But just know, because we're out of time, it's already an hour. Holy cow. Um, yes, the Beamer as well. Um, Alzheimer's is the is the only one of, um, of of the United States top ten most common causes of death for which there is no effective treatment whatsoever. We can't put you in remission. We don't have you know like like cancer or you know there's no cure for it. Prevention is the key, and we have to fight to keep our brain. I can't imagine anything scarier than losing your brain and losing your memory. I can't imagine how scared my mom is and we have such a strained um, relationship anyway and it has been extremely difficult to um, manage this, this pathway. I, I just can't imagine when you know that you're losing your mind and there's nothing that you can do. And we know there's plenty that can be done, but in my case, there's nothing that can be done. She refuses to do anything. So um, Alzheimer's disease not only robs the victim, but it robs the entire family of this patient's life and their friends and their social circle and their job. I mean, it completely destroys families and communities. It does. Um, destroys them of the life, you know, that God designed them to live. So I am devastated by this disease. I know that it's a disease of prevention. And, you know, if it's going to start in our 40s, then we need to start changing. We need to, if we're feeding our kids a bunch of crap, then they need to be eating what we're eating. Why are we feeding our kids crap when we're trying to over here drink green juices and eat healthy? Well, you know, I don't, I don't, understand that but this next generation of children we have got to change their little gut we didn't talk about probiotics we didn't talk about well we did somewhat but we didn't talk about changing the microbiome i mean that's huge right your gut is 80 percent of your immune system 80 percent of all inflammation in your body stems from the health of the gut so a good probiotic eating an anti-inflammatory diet all of those things that we know we have to do okay there's a ton of information here i rattled through this you guys can go back and watch it but prevention 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 and and anything you can do it, you, whatever you put in your mouth you just say holy sh holy crap is this going to heal me or is this going to kill me it's as simple as that there's no in between there's no such thing as junk food mark hyman says there's junk and there's food Remember, genetics is the gun, but your environment pulls the trigger. We don't have to pull the trigger, and I am determined to stop this cycle in my family. I don't know what my kids' genetic uh, makeup is for APOE, but I know that I've, I've got a pretty decent one here, and I am not going to turn it on. I, I refuse to do it, and I hope 30 years from now I'm sitting here doing what I do. Um, Maybe a little more high tech, not in front of a computer, but I love you guys. And I will answer these questions when this is over tonight. I will sit down and, and go over your questions and all. But um, this week at Integrative Family Medicine, tomorrow, 7 a.m. starts our drive for Panama City Beach. Um, the very beginning of this, I talked about my best friend from college lives on the beach in Panama City. She was spared. I mean, she lost electricity and water, but her home is there. But her city, is devastated and it is nothing but a state of destruction there and her friends and her co-workers have lost their homes have lost everything we have a driver who's going to be driving every week from now until thanksgiving week and i'll be down there thanksgiving week as well um taking supplies and the list is on the danny williamson wellness page under events it says help panama city i can't remember what i wrote it last night but it has a huge list drop your supplies off. I've got a friend, Priscilla Hill, emailed me this afternoon on Instagram. She said that her church, they raised $700 this morning in her, her Sunday school, I guess, in her church. And she's bringing that to the office Thursday and I'm going to buy all the supplies. So please drop them off. 
at the office, just come in. I mean, they, you can't get, they can't get too much water. It's going to be months before they have water again. This Friday night, the Hashimoto support group meeting at Nashville Restorative Dentistry, 6.30 Friday night. Again, the event is on there. 6.30 Friday night, the Hashimoto support group meeting. We're going to be talking about the nature throid and the WP shortage and planning our holiday uh, Christmas party as well. November the 2nd, Mary Chabinko is going to be leading the toxic skin care uh, workshop at the office. And we're going to be talking about skin care. We're going to be talking about um, your environment, your toxic products, everything, not just skin care, not just crunchy. She, she uh, sells crunchy as a rep for crunchy and I've been using it and I love it. That's November the 2nd, 630. You need to RSVP because we only have limited space. November 16th, 6.30 is a Friday night. We have the benzodiazepine addiction lunch and learn, but it'll be a dinner and learn. No dinner, but I'm not supplying dinner. But November 16th, 6.30 at my office, Donna West has agreed to um, help me lead that. And she has beat Xanax addiction and she is open with her story. And we've been trying to do this for a couple of years. If you know anyone who's hooked on the benzodiazepine, Xanax, Clonopin, Ativan, um, Librium, Librax, any of it, even Ambien, which is not, but you need to come to this. It's going to be phenomenal. I am so excited about this. And it is a it's, it's, everybody's ashamed of it. There's no shame in being addicted to Xanax. No shame whatsoever. The shame comes from the person who continues to prescribe that for you. So, so don't get me started on this, but I love you guys. I am six minutes over. And then also we're having a breast implant illness, lunch and learn on um, patients with breast implants who have breast implant illness. And we don't have the date set because we're trying, I'm trying to get two people who are very active to, to help me with that one and their schedules are not syncing up nobody's schedule syncing up but anyway have a great weekend guys and i will answer your questions i love you next sunday night dr motley will be sitting right here beside me because i am way better when he's sitting here and we're going to be discussing the power of gratitude in health and healing since we're getting into the holiday season and he doesn't know we're discussing that i probably should text him and tell him <laughs> I just decided this afternoon I wanted to talk about gratitude. So anyway, guys, have a great week. Please come drop off anything, supplies, gift cards to Walmart. They have a lot of Walmarts down in Panama City, so I know that those gift cards could go, but I think really even more so supplies. So we'll see you this week. I love you. Happy Sunday. Have a good week and take care of your brain all right remember this is the disease of prevention take care of your brain